Hi, this is Robert Rich, and I make uh, electronic, surrealist, ambient, instrumental music uh, out here in Northern California. And um, I'm speaking with Moog Music right now. One of the things that's such a joy about analog modular synthesizers is that they are not event-based sound generators. They are always making sound inside of themselves, and all you're doing is shaping that sound or gating it or causing it to, uh, to squeeze out of it in some way or another. You know, so the oscillators are always sitting there humming, right? And you just have to patch into them. As soon as you turn on the power, it's making sound inside of itself. And so it's almost like it has a, a, a nervous system, a, a pulse, a, a kind of blood flow. And so when you program this wonderful analog computer, what you're doing is sort of shaping the direction of these rivers of, of information and, and opening up gates with the VCAs and with the envelopes to, to uh, let them out into the world in a shaped way. And, and this, is, this is a gestural-based system. It's not an event-based system. So when we're looking at MIDI, we have these note-on, note-off events, and everything is, is, is modularized in a packet, right? Whereas analog is not that. It's a gesture, and, and that gestural aspect of uh, real analog synthesis, and especially modular synthesizers, is to me still one of the most important uh, inspirational aspects of, uh, of creating new sound with synthesizers. Some of my earliest musical memories were listening to my father play jazz back in the 60s. Uh, he's a jazz guitarist and was very influenced by the cool school, San Francisco, uh, people like Stan Getz and uh, Barney Kessel. The sense that music was something that could be played and that it was something free and, um, you know, uh, that, that, that there was a discipline, but there was also improvisation and that it was fun uh, is an idea that I grew up with. And... Uh, I also was always a, a nature lover and would listen a lot to the sounds outside my window as a kid, um, the sounds of frogs calling to each other, the, the western tree frog, what we would call the spring peepers. And uh, I, I think I learned polyrhythm from them uh, because there would always be a space, the syncopation that they would leave um, a, a moment for the other one to call kind of as they, as they define their physical space across the, the distance of a creek. That and just the sounds of, of wind and rain gave me a sense of of how the ear could hear around corners in places where the eyes could never see. And I wanted to try to um, relate some of those experiences of, of almost out-of-body listening to an art form that could somehow change people, you know. So some of my influences were, were improvised music and other influences were just the world around me, I think. So I was as a high school kid building modular synths and experimenting with a sustained sound environments and trying to get the synths patched up so that they would play themselves and keep changing. And I enjoyed this idea of kind of walking into my bedroom at any time of day or night and hearing the sound sort of like, like there was a cricket cage in the room or something like that, um, except sounding like, like whales underwater or, uh, you know, strange little metal bells tinkling or something and found myself attracted to a way of listening that wasn't uh, in, in order to hear a, a sort of peak and valley of emotion in the music, but rather attracted to this idea of sound as, a, as evocative of, of a place or evocative of a mood. And so I was trying to think of ways to frame an experience that would be ritual and social um, and out of the ordinary, so it would take people out of their everyday space yet also would change their expectations of performance so that they wouldn't be expecting to be entertained, but rather to be framed in a sense that they could go inside of themselves and they would be um, naturally predisposed to doing that. So I was, I was a college student. I was a freshman in college and I uh, put up posters on telephone poles and I made a free concert uh, that January of 1982. And... Um, uh, about 15 people showed up and I played all night long um, with recordings of ambient sound and loops, um, you know, cassettes with, with drones and things like that. So, um, you know, as, as, as many things as I could pull together with very limited 
um, electronic uh, set of tools. And and then, of course, you know, I'm 18 years old and trying to put my name on the map. And I, I, I got, you know, I, I sort of documented that event and sent some letters around to people uh, and I uh, to, to, to offer my services to do some more of these. And then I did a few more over the years. I got into sleep research as an undergraduate and did a sleep concert for the Association of Sleep and Dreaming at a uh, conference center uh, in Monterey on the Pacific Coast. The experience from some of the audience members varied, of course, by their own personalities. Uh, some people would have lucid dreams. Some people um, became very sensitized to sound, which is truly one of the things I wanted to have happen because the sleep concerts are extremely quiet. A lot of people would wake up from these in the morning feeling very quiet and very uh, sharply attuned to the sounds around them. And that's kind of the way I spend a lot of my time when I'm not working on music. I prefer silence. I prefer to hear the world around me. And being able to share that idea or that approach to listening uh, is a pleasure for me. I, I joke sometimes that I don't even remember how to make my own music. Every time I start an album, I, I'm a little lost. I don't really know my own methods. I. I I fish around in the dark, often with a microphone and and things, objects, and I'll I'll make noises <laughs> into, you know, I'll set up a little binary microphone set up with with some omnis, and scratch and wiggle things in front of them and see if that comes up with anything evocative. Uh, sometimes I'll patch up the modular, try to make it sound like animals, <laughs> try to make it sound like something, and. What I love about doing that with the modular is that you, you have to keep the record button handy. And if you start actually recording things and committing to sound, then, then you have something at least to start with. You have some fodder. And so then I'll chop things up and I'll move it around and I'll stretch it and I'll half speed it. Um, and, and before I realize what happened, I have the beginnings of, of a piece. What I have to remind myself is that creativity starts with play. And I try to remember to start with this idea of play and, and to, to explore and experiment and to get a little silly, to, 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 to take risks outside of a comfort zone or outside of a style or, or what I think anybody expects. And then I might throw it away, but, but at least then I'll have something that, that makes me laugh, you know, that starts out with something fun. If art can remind us of the impact that we have as a species, perhaps we're doing something good.